Great. Good morning, church. Please stand with me. Let's begin our service in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together as your people. And Lord, we pray that you'd be honored and glorified as we worship you, as we offer up songs and praise to your name. You are so worthy. In your name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing. You are the blood, the water, the vine. You are the word and you are the life. 
Only Jesus, only Jesus, only Jesus, who is true is high. Only Jesus Christ, only Jesus, only Jesus, only Jesus who is true and high. Only Jesus Christ, only Jesus, only Jesus, who is true is high. Only Jesus Christ. Only Jesus, only Jesus, who is lifted high, only Jesus Christ. Only Jesus, only Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. Morning, y'all. So in case you're wondering, I did not get punched in the face. I, uh, I have really bad allergies, and so every spring I just feel like nature is trying to kill me. <laughs> and uh, this is the, in, in my 30 years of living, which, you know, isn't, isn't that long of a time, um, I've tried, like, everything to, like, get over it, and just plugging the nose with tissues, the, the best thing i found, so... If you, uh, if you suffer from the same thing I do, try it. It works. <laughs> um, okay, so announcements. Um, so May the 4th, which is also, I believe it's Star Wars Day as well. Uh, May the 4th, uh, we're going to have a church yard cleanup. So if you like wander out into the parking lot and you look at sort of the back along the fence here, you might find there's a few pieces of trash and stuff like that. And so uh, it's just a time for us to, to help clean up, you know, the lot and just make everything look pretty. Um, so if you're av available to, to participate in that, again, it's May the 4th um, at 8.30. Is Bill here? It's 8, 8.30 in the morning, right? Yeah, it's a good time. Um, and then next Tuesday, we're going to have our last class on a Trinity, which we're going to be talking about uh, God the Spirit, and Frank will be teaching that. And so, uh, again, it's six. It's uh, next Tuesday here at the building from 6 to 7.30. We will provide uh, food and child care so everyone can make it. And again, feel free to uh, invite anyone you'd like. It's not just for, for people here at Sandy Ridge. So, um, yeah, I think that's it for, for today. Um, if you've got kids ages 1 to 10, please bring them to, to Children's Church. So, thanks, y'all. Grab your Bibles, please, and open up to the book of John, chapter 10. The book of John, chapter 10. We're going to be continuing our journey through that book today. While you're turning there, let me open us in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word here today, Lord. As we go through a very famous passage, I pray that you would help us to understand what you would have us understand, Lord, that you would help us to learn a little bit more about your character, and ultimately, Lord, I pray that we would be encouraged and motivated by the words that we're going to hear today. We love you so much, Lord, in your name we pray, amen. So we're going to be in John chapter 10, starting in verse 22. It says this, at the time of the Feast of Dedication, or at that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The word of the Lord. As John has done quite a bit, he gives us some uh, indication of where and when we are. The last, 
a couple of months that we've been in John, uh, John has kind of placed us at a place that's not very far out from the cross. Kind of keep in mind that we are in the final stretch, even though there's quite a bit more of the book of John to go, we are already in the final stretch of Jesus' life, the last couple of months before he would be murdered and then resurrected on the cross. And so we already saw the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles, which was one of their biggest holidays of the year, we mentioned. Um, it was basically like Thanksgiving and New Year's all mixed up in one. It was the beginning of their year, but it was also their hall, fall harvest. And so that was in the fall. Now we are in the winter, and we are looking at the Feast of the Dedication. This is not a feast that God commanded in the Old Testament. He commands lots of feasts, right? Uh, he commands his people to celebrate Passover. He commands his people to celebrate Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. He commands his people to celebrate the Feast of Booths. He does not command them to do this one. Uh, they chose to do this one. Sometimes holidays are fun, right? <laughs> uh, no, this one, uh, there's another name for the Feast of the Dedication. In Hebrew, you would call it Hanukkah. So this is Hanukkah. Um, this is when this happens. Hanukkah actually celebrates some events that happened in the intertestamental period. So in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there was a rebellion by the Maccabees and they won. And so that's what Hanukkah celebrates. And so during this time, I mean, see it's winter and Jesus died at what time of year? The spring. That's when we celebrate Easter. Uh, unlike Christmas, that one actually did happen in the spring because that's when Passover is and it's tied to Passover. And so we know that we've only got just a, a couple more months until Jesus will be on the cross. So kind of keep that in your mind. I think John wants us to be aware of that as he's kind of ramping up the ministry of Jesus and as uh, Jesus is continuing to say things that are riling up the Pharisees and the teachers of the law around him. Uh, interestingly enough, it places him in the colonnade of Solomon. So basically, he's in kind of a sheltered, more indoor area because it's cold, it's winter. Now, the people ask Jesus straight up if he's the Messiah. We have seen already he's been doing nonstop miracles. He's done some pretty incredible miracles for very large groups. He fed 5,000 people from about one child's worth of lunch, right? And so you've had lots of people following him. He's healed people in very public places. He's done miraculous things. And already the rumors, I mean, from the very beginning, the rumors have been spreading, is this the promised Messiah? Remember, these folks have not had a prophet from God in 400 years. So their grandparents, their grandparents' grandparents don't remember what it was like to have somebody directly from God talking to them. Likewise, there aren't a lot of folks going around doing miracles during these periods. And now suddenly, here's a man who everywhere he goes, he heals people. Everywhere he goes, he's doing miraculous events. And he's not just doing miracles, but he's preaching in a way that they have never heard before. He is preaching as one with authority. He is uh, finding new and interesting insights in the scriptures. He is applying them in a way that they have never heard them applied before. And so the rumor has been going around for quite some time, is this guy the Messiah? Messiah comes from the, Greek, or the Hebrew word Mashiach. It means the anointed one. Uh, and the Greek word, because uh, Greek was kind of the common language, uh, Aramaic was the common language, but Greek was the common written language amongst everyone, was Christ. Christ means the anointed one. Christ means Messiah. They're the same word. Just one's in Hebrew, one's in Greek. So they ask him, are you the Christ? Are you the one that God has been promising us for the entire Old Testament that would come to save his people. Are you this guy? Now here's the thing about this question. Jesus is the Christ. We call him Jesus Christ. Not because it's his last name. It's a title kind of thing, right? Uh, he absolutely, without a doubt, was the Messiah. He was the one who God had prophesied all throughout the Old Testament. He was the one who came and saved not just God's people, but he expanded God's people to those who were not prior God's people. We talked about this last week. We, as almost exclusively Gentiles in this room, benefited from the Messiah that came to save not just the Jews, but any who would believe on his name. So he absolutely is the Messiah. But as you go through the Gospels, you do not see him call himself the Messiah once in front of a big group. 
Jesus is frequently preaching in front of big groups. He's frequently having uh, uh, sparring matches with the Pharisees in front of large groups. There are frequently huge groups gathered to see him perform miracles. He never once ever says, yes, I'm the Messiah. And so here they ask him, are you the Messiah? And we'll get to it in a second, but he does not give them a straight answer. He does not say yes for sure. He does, however, sometimes call him the Messiah, himself the Messiah. We already saw when he met with a Samaritan woman at a well in the middle of the day, and nobody else was around, not even his disciples. She asks him, are you, the, are you the Messiah that our forefathers prophesied? And he says, I am he. Yes, I am the Messiah. Later on in Matthew 16, a uh, different gospel, but still the account of Jesus' life, he talks to his disciples and he says, I am the Messiah. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> Uh, so he absolutely confirms to people that he is the Messiah. This is not something that Jesus is unaware of. He is the Messiah. He knows he's the Messiah. He thinks of himself as the Messiah. But he never affirms it in front of large groups. It's just one more of many things that we see with Jesus that's really counterintuitive. Would not the Messiah want to be broadcasting this to as many people as possible? But no. They ask him, are you the Messiah? And Jesus says what? He doesn't say yes. He doesn't say no either. He says, I already told you. Classic Jesus. Never, ever gives a straight answer to a question. Now, what does I already told you mean? Because he hadn't said it in that, those exact words. He had never, to this group of people, to any large group of people, said, hey, by the way, I am the Messiah. He has never said that. I think, and commentators think as well, the issue is the fact that they, in their minds, have a certain picture of what the Messiah was. They had a very clear picture of what they were expecting based off of certain texts from the Old Testament, but not all the texts from the Old Testament. And so if Jesus had said, yes, I am the Messiah, they would have had a very specific picture of what that meant. They would have pictured him as a political figure. Because for them, the Messiah was the one who was going to come lead a rebellion against Rome. He was going to be the guy who came and said, I'm taking over the Jews. Get out of here, Herod's family, right? I'm taking over. Things are going to go a little differently now. Everybody go get your swords because we're going to have ourselves a little rebellion here. We're going to fight. Oh, by the way, Hanukkah is the celebration of a successful Jewish rebellion against the leaders, right? And so all the people are kind of expecting the Messiah to come and say, hey, we're going to drive the Romans out of here. Right? We hate the Romans. They are not Jewish. They don't worship the true God. And yet they are in charge of us. And yet they oppress us. And yet they have all of these uh, rules and things which weigh us down. We are God's people. We are meant to be free. We are meant to rule ourselves. We are meant to conquer and expand God's kingdom. Right? And so they were expecting the Messiah to come and be a political and a military figure to come and conquer. But of course, when Jesus came, he was not even remotely close to either of those things, was he? He was about as far away from those as you could possibly be. And in just a couple short months, we are going to watch him be murdered, tried unjustly, on strung up false charges. We're going to watch him be murdered. We're going to watch him be strung up on the cross, a criminal's death, the most ignominious death you could have, torturous as well, and then put in a borrowed grave, a buried grave. This is not what anyone was expecting. And so if Jesus had said, yeah, I'm the Messiah, they would have just not even known what he was saying. They would have gone in a completely different direction. What Jesus is doing when he says, I already told you, is to cause them to ask, did you? What, what did he say? And to start looking into what does the Bible say about the Messiah? What did he say that lines up with this? We've heard the words that he said. He's spoken a lot about scripture uh, what, what does all of this mean? And he, he, he is inviting them to go back and study what God has said so that they can discern what he has actually indicated, how he has indicated himself as the Messiah. His miracles and his sermons were enough, in other words, to have known that he was from God, ultimately. People should have been able to tell. The miracles that he performed paired with the expert handling of the scriptures 
was enough for people to have known that he was from God. And from that point, they would have been able to determine by the things that he was saying that he was the Messiah. Not the Messiah that was the military leader, but the Isaiah 53 Messiah that we've brought up quite a bit over this series. The suffering servant, the one who came to take the iniquities of the world onto himself, the one who by his stripes we are cleansed. Those are literal stripes. He is going to be flayed before he is put up on the cross. And so when that happens, everyone who knew their scriptures should have been able to look at that and say, oh, oh, it's that Messiah. Okay. Now, as has been the norm throughout this whole section, Jesus kind of hops between a couple of different uh, noteworthy things for us. And so we've talked about him being the Messiah. The people ask him, and he will not give them a straight answer. He says, I've already told you, okay, he is the Messiah, uh, but he wants them to figure it out, basically, because their mindset's not in the right place to even understand what the Messiah is. And now he goes back to this motif that we have seen him using for the past several weeks. You guys sick of sheep yet? <laughs> No, of course not, because Jesus is not done with the sheep, and so we are not done with the sheep. He says again, um, the ones who recognize that he are the Messiah are his flock. He says, you don't recognize me as such, but my sheep do. And then he gives this passage, and this is where we're going to camp out and spend the rest of our uh, day today. In verse 28, he says, I give my sheep eternal life and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. I give my sheep eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. This is pretty rich, okay? Um, this is like a, a, a really thick fudge cake kind of thing where you can't eat the whole thing. This is rich. So we're going to take some time to pull this apart and see what it is that Jesus is saying here. First of all, he says that he gives his sheep eternal life. He gives his sheep eternal life. I have often said it, that this eternal life that Jesus speaks of lowers the stakes for Christians in this life. The eternal life that we are offered as Christians lowers the stakes for us as we go about living this mortal life. What do I mean by that? When Paul is asked, well, what if you die doing your missionary journeys, he responds with what? To live as Christ, to die is gain. To live as Christ, to die is gain. As a Christian, the worst that can happen to you is not, uh, well, is, is, is mortal death, right? Someone can take our lives. For the secular world, this is absolutely devastating because for them, there is nothing aside from this mortal life. So if you take away their life, or if you take away their freedom, or if you take away any of those things, this life is all they feel they have to live, and so that is it. That is life altering, that is life ruining, that is taking everything from them. They will do anything to avoid that, usually, because for them, this is it. You only have one life. Carpe diem, see if this is the day, right? Go out and, and, and live your life. Uh, do everything that you can to live the life that you feel like, it, 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 you know, makes you flourish the most, that fills you up the most, where you feel. And yet for the Christians, we don't tend to live this way. We tend to live lives that are very self-sacrificial. We tend to uh, live lives where we uh, do not do always or even frequently the things that we want to do, but rather things that we would rather not do for the benefit of others. In fact, we are commanded to do so by Christ. You think Jesus wanted to live the life that we see in the gospel? No, he could have been very comfortable. He's a smart dude, right? Uh, he could have set up shop as one of the Pharisees. He could have played the game right. He could have uh, risen up to the top of the echelons of power easily. He had the mind of God, right? <laughs> And the power of God, too. He could have uh, led a religious movement that instead of um, uh, continuing to rise and then fall, we've seen he loses disciples as quickly as he gets them. He could have uh, converted all of Judea. He could have been the Messiah that led an army. He didn't do any of those things. Why? Because he loved us, and what was required to save us was sacrifice, not comfort. 
In the same way, we as his followers, our people throughout history, have led lives that were not as comfortable, not by half as they could have been. We have people who have made enormous sacrifices. We have had people who have given up everything that they cared about, everything they've known to move halfway across the world, to pour into and love and serve people who didn't speak the same language, who were not of the same culture, who were viewed by their contemporaries and their peers as, as uh, weird or subhuman. Or we, have, we have Christians who have devoted their lives to starting hospitals or orphanages. We have Christians who have given up everything they owned to the poor. We have Christians who have spent time with lepers. We have Christians who, um, rather than flee in the midst of natural disasters, have stayed to aid and help and rebuild. What allows our people to do this is not that we have tricked ourselves or convinced ourselves into enjoying adversity, right? Uh, that we, that somehow we've tricked ourselves into believing that, you know, suffering is good in and of itself. It's not. The Bible doesn't teach that. But what gives Christianity its power, what gives our people this unique ability to undergo uh, anything less than full pursuit of our own desires and our own good and our own comfort is the fact that we know this life is not all that there is. We know that this life isn't anything compared to the next one. Paul says that in those exact words in Romans 8. He says, for I do not consider this life to be worthy of comparing of the next one. He says, this life, this is like a woman in childbirth, right? The world, if we're going to anthropomorphize the world, it's like a woman who's in the midst of giving birth. Ladies, is that fun? <laughs> is that like, uh, that, that like a good thing? Like, hey, yeah, this is, you know, um, no. A lot of pain, a lot of suffering. It's actually a pretty good metaphor for a lot of the things we see in this world. Have you ever looked around and said, hey, the things that are going on, this is like a woman in the midst of childbirth <laughs> with all the labor pains, no epidural for this world, right? And the baby is probably breached. I don't know. Um, <laughs> what this world is giving birth to is the next world. Having a newborn, that is fun. As long as you don't mind not sleeping, right? No, but holding your baby, looking at the baby with all the newness and the innocence and the, um, the, the, the potential. This metaphor is a good metaphor. Christians have believed this because this is what the Bible teaches. This world is nothing compared to the next one. The next world is going to be awesome. So when Jesus talks about this eternal life, this is ultimately what he is giving to us, a, a gift of the eternal life. Okay, that's the main gift for sure. But also a gift of the recognition, that, a gift of power, frankly. Because if you really believe this, if you really internalize this, it gives you the unique power to be stupid in the world's eyes. Not, not really stupid, right? You know, the Bible talks all the time about the wisdom of God is foolishness in the eyes of the world. To uh, give up everything that you own and go be a missionary in some far-flung corner of the world so that you can share the gospel, that's foolish in the eyes of the world. It's stupid. To uh, donate your time and your effort to uh, things where you will not have a guaranteed return. You can pour into folks... Okay, you can pour into the down and out. You can go preach in the prisons. You can do lots of these things. And, and, and the one thing that I can guarantee you is that you will not have gratitude from those folks to the level that you feel you are owed. <laughs> because you know exactly how much you've sacrificed. All that time, all the effort, all the pain, all the uh, pouring into folks to watch them just get to a point where like, yes, their life is trending in a better direction. Things are working. All this effort I put in, it's ha and then no, they crash and burn and they're lower than before, right? If you expect to uh, feel, at least get that sense of gratitude consistently and, and have that fill you up, it's not there. You've got to be motivated by eternity. And so it's foolish for people to pour their lives, for Christians to do what we do, basically, in the eyes of the world. That's not actually foolish. Because we know that what we're doing is investing in the future kingdom. 
We know that this life is not all that there is. We know that we are called to be obedient to Jesus, to pursue his mission, to start building his kingdom now, but his kingdom will be fully inaugurated later, and we get to live there. And so, we get to be bold. Because the loss of our comfort in this mortal life isn't nothing. It is nothing. The loss of our very lives, it's not worthy to be compared to eternity. Because even if we are not martyred as Christians, even if we are not persecuted to the extent where we lose our lives, we're going to live to what, 80? 90 if you're going past the actuarial tables? The oldest humans that have ever lived are shy of 120 years. Eternity lasts forever. And so we can take risks for the kingdom because we know that we have eternal life. We can be bold for the kingdom. We can do hard things now because things will be easy later. This is almost unique to Christianity. It does not mean that other folks don't do pro-social and um, uh, sacrificial things. But I think that we've got a stronger pitch for why that makes sense for people to do. Now, Jesus says that his sheep will never perish. Perish is old English word for to die. Um, Hopefully, most of y'all aren't using perish in your everyday language. But it, it goes along with the thought that he gives eternal life. It's the flip side to that. You won't die. This, of course, does not mean that we will never die in this mortal life because death is assured for every Christian until Christ comes back. But, as we'll soon see, we will die, but then be raised into an unending life. There's a lot of metaphors that Jesus has been using recently in the book of John. He called himself the bread of life. He said, anyone who eats of me won't be hungry again. He calls himself the living water. He says, if you drink from me, you'll never be thirsty again. He calls himself the light of life. He calls himself the abundant pasture just uh, last week. All of these are metaphors for eternity with Christ. And so as he says, my sheep um, will have, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. This is uh, echoing what he has already been saying this whole time. He himself not just gives us a state where we will not perish, where our bodies will continue, where our lives will continue, but also he fills it up. He fills it up with meaning. He fills it up with direction. He fills it up with God's glory. He fills it up with all of these wonderful things. He fills it up with safety. And so, as we hear these words, um, our hearts ought to be drawn to worship, I think. This is one of the most powerful motivators in all of Christianity, the sense that we will live forever. And we ought to spend regular time worshiping God for this. When we come to that phrase, no one can take them out of my hand. No one can take them out of my hand. What does this mean? Does this mean that anyone who belongs to Jesus, who is a Christian, cannot become an apostate? What's an apostate? An apostate is someone who is a part of a religious movement, and then they decide that they don't believe it anymore and then they are not a part, right? That's an apostate. So, is Jesus teaching here that his sheep can never become apostates? I don't think so. Um, Because we have lots of examples in our own lives of people who used to call themselves Christians and who do not today, right? This is an extremely common thing. But also, we see apostasy in the New Testament. Jesus called how many disciples? to follow him. He called 12 directly. He went up to them and said, hey, come follow me. And then they did. How many disciples stuck with him? 11. Even one of his hand-picked guys fell into apostasy and died not as one of his flock. 
No, Jesus isn't saying that apostasy doesn't exist. Judas was an apostate, and he had literally every single advantage. Jesus, God himself, called him directly by name. Uh, Indeed, Jesus gives a parable in Mark about four seeds that is frequently used when we talk about these things. Uh, If you want to join me in Mark chapter 4, We'll go ahead and read it just so we get the words exactly right. Verse 3, Jesus says, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. Okay, this is a farmer who is sowing seeds. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil. And immediately it sprung up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. Now, as with so many of Jesus' parables, the people didn't really understand. He said, seeds, what? We don't understand what you're saying. And even his disciples didn't understand we're told in Mark. And so they come and ask him, and he tells them, and he's going to explain it just for them because they're special. In verse 14, he gives his explanation. And he says this, the sower sows the word, the word of God, right, the gospel. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. Uh, And the others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. You see? So Jesus says this, there's four kinds of people when they hear the gospel. The gospel goes out. We are an evangelistic religion. Evangelistic, from the Greek word euangelion, it means the gospel. We are the ones who share the gospel. And as the gospel goes out, there's four kinds of people. The first kind hears it, and they want no truck with it. Satan comes and steals it from them. They don't believe even for a second. They hear it, and they say, this is ridiculous. This is foolish, if you would. But the second group, they hear it, and they're like, I love it. I'm in, right? They spring right up, just like plants that are planted in shallow soil. But because they don't have a strong root structure, the second difficulties come into their life, tribulations and things like that, they get destroyed. And they're like, you know what? Maybe God's not real. I was promised that God would make everything comfortable and nice and awesome. And instead, now all these hard things are happening to me. My life has been upended. Where is God? Why is he allowing these things to happen to me? And they apostatize and they leave. The third group comes up at a normal pace, but they come up in the midst of weeds and thorns and brambles and all sorts of competing flora. They come and choke them out. Just as in gardening, you have to weed and and make sure plants aren't too close or the roots compete in the same way. They're coming up in Jesus, but also there's all the rest of everything. The entire weight of the world, the entire desires to fit in, the things that they want in culture, the uh, things that their flesh desires but that the Bible commands them to forego all come up and it's just too much. And they say, you know what, I would rather not have to deal with Christianity. I just want to go and be normal and live like everybody else. And finally, there's the good soil where the plants come up and they grow and they are fruitful and in fact they multiply. Those second two groups are interesting, are they not? Because those actually do seem to be the two groups of folks we see leaving the Christian faith. 
Uh, I have an example of the first group where people encounter some tribulation and they say, God must not be real. I have a dear, dear friend who had more than her share of difficulty in this life. Um, objectively, she just had misfortune upon misfortune fall on her at a very young age. And when I knew her, she was a strong Christian. Um, when I knew her, she had a beautiful heart um, and loved God. And after one final injustice, one final tribulation, one final difficulty, a, a big one, uh, my understanding is that she left the Christian faith because it was just too much. Too many things came along and her faith was not at the point where it could endure. Do you know anybody like this? Any folks who have experienced an unusual sickness or known someone close to them who has uh, experienced something that's just not within the norms of what most people have. Someone who's had a car accident. Someone who's had uh, something really abusive and terrible happen within their life. This can be a powerful motivator for people to leave. To ask God, why did you allow this to happen? To uh, turn around to hatred towards God for uh, what, 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 what seems to have been unusually specific things that he has allowed to happen just to you. The third group is the ones who fall too much in love with the world. And there's almost, um, amongst pastors, there's a widespread recognition that frequently when we have folks coming and saying, hey, I've listened to such and such or so or so, I've watched some YouTube videos that show how the Bible is actually not like intellectually very robust, right? There's all sorts of contradictions. It's all broken. It's all wrong, right? Um, and, and Christians are foolish for believing this. I watched some really convincing stuff for young Christian students who go away to college and their first professor is like, hey, have you ever heard about this in the Bible? And they're like, no, that's not in there. And they look and they're like, oh, there it is. That's a difficult thing. I've never heard about this before. And then their faith is destroyed and they leave, right? Amongst pastors, we have found it to be the case that almost always, in addition to all of this, like, you know, newfound intellectual fervor and all of this, um, also they definitely wanted to sleep with their girlfriend out of wedlock. <laughs> What I mean by it is this, uh, it is absolutely the case that many, many people who leave Christianity have a problem first with the laws that God lays out, first with the things that Christ demands of us, first with the difficulties of being a Christian because Jesus does ask us to live lives that are not comfortable, that are sacrificial, where we love our enemies and do not respond in vengeance to slights against us, where we love others even when they hate us, where we give up our money to serve uh, causes that, that, that uh, push forward with the kingdom. It's a hard thing, and many just don't want to do it. And, and many get tired over years of struggling with this. Can't we just fit in? Why do we have to be weird? Why do we have to care about the things that the culture hates? Why do we have to uh, push forward with political opinions that are uncomfortable and that are not shared by the majority of people? Why can't we just fit in? Why can't we just be normal? It's a powerful thing that leads many away from the church. Now the question then is, are these folks saved? Because a lot of times, while they're in the church, they're really convincing Christians, right? They're not the folks who we would call nominal. That means name only. We know nominal Christians. They show up two times a year. What they are about, Christmas and Easter. Um, they don't live lives that are in any way, shape, or form different from the people around them, as all Christians must. They don't know anything about the Bible, even uh, basic passages they're unaware. They don't read it. They don't go to church. They don't listen to sermons. They're not Christians, but they call themselves Christians. No, there are sometimes folks who, 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 who functionally look just like all of us, and yet at some point they apostatize. Are they saved? Because we are told that we are not saved by our works, right? But we're saved by faith. And we are saved in a moment of justification. That 
You are made right before God in a legal sense in an instant. We call it justification. That the moment that you turn from your sin and repent and believe in Christ, you are saved. So these folks, many of them would claim, I have absolutely done that. But then they do not do the second part, which is where Christ calls us to become sanctified, to become holy, to uh, become like him, to live Christian lives, to mature in the faith. So can you have justification without sanctification? Brothers and sisters, I've spent a lot of time over the years wrestling with this question. And I've gotten to the point where I can affirm, I'm not sure. (laughs) This is one of those mysteries. The Bible teaches that justification is what saved us. The thief on the cross who died next to Jesus, the one who was not making fun of him, injuring at him while they were both dying. The one who said, leave him alone. This guy hasn't done anything wrong. We're both murderers, those two on the other sides of him. But this dude in the middle, he did nothing wrong. And Jesus says what? Today you will be with me in paradise. This man believed in Jesus, and that is all he did. He did not even have time to do one good Christ-honoring sanctification work, right? Because he died immediately after believing in Jesus. And yet Jesus says, you'll be with me today in paradise. And yet the Bible is very, very clear That it is not enough just to become justified if you want to be a Christian. Justification is the beginning of your new life. You are born again. You become a little infant and then you grow up into maturity of Jesus. It, It says you literally become a new person. The old is gone, the new has come. If you're not living a Christian life, are you a part of Christ's flock? I don't think so. Because to be a part of Christ's flock, Jesus says the requirement is you know his voice. How can you possibly know his voice if you aren't living a Christian life? If you don't know anything about the scriptures, if you haven't followed his command to be in community with other Christians, if you um, aren't living a life of self-sacrificial love, if you aren't following the commands of Christ, in, in what way do you know his voice? How would you be able to know that? We've seen this over the last couple of weeks, this metaphor that he's put out. And and not only that, but the Bible talks an enormous amount about the need for Christians to endure in their faith. We're going to be talking about this plenty later on in John. But it says it again and again and again. A, A great representative passage is in Hebrews 3. It says this, verse 12. Take care, brothers. Lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. You see, that sounds like it's really important to hold Our original confidence firm to the end, does it not? So the answer is this. Is justification enough to say, well, you know, the rewards are probably going to be lacking for folks who are apostates, but they, 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 they may be in heaven when we get there. I don't know. I would feel very uncomfortable. I'd feel very uncomfortable teaching that. Because the Bible says the signs of true repentance, of true belief in Christ, are what? The fruits. The fruits of the gospel. And it is important for those to maintain and endure and hold on to their original confidence to the end. Now there's a brief aside. Sometimes those fall away who fall away come back. Do they not? In America especially, it is not unusual at all to have kids who are raised up in a Christian church and then who go away to college and and then decide, I I don't believe any of what I was raised with anymore, and and then to live life for a while and then later on in adulthood to be like, you know what, actually, maybe there was something to the faith of my childhood, to the faith of my parents, to the faith that I was raised up into, and they come back. This is something that does happen. Uh, Peter denied Christ three times. 
Remember? Uh, the ultimate act of apostasy. <laughs> People are saying, hey, weren't you one of his followers? And he's like, no, leave me alone. I don't know this guy. I want nothing to do with him. And yet he came back. Uh, we also see in 1 Corinthians 5, that's the passage where Paul's talking about a man in the church in Corinth who's doing stuff that's so gross that even the pagans look at it and say, that's weird, right? And, and Paul says what? I have delivered this guy over to Satan. Uh, push him out of the church so that he can experience what it's like to be outside of the congregation. This is one of those rare instances where he says you need to uh, 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 push someone out, right? Not so that they can be punished, but so that they can return and join the flock. And so, what I would say is this. For those we know who have fallen away from the um, the church, I do not believe that it is wise for us to apply the words of Jesus where he says, no one can take them out of my hand to these folks. I think we should approach them the same way that we approach any non-believer. If someone has once claimed to be a Christian and now they have left, they still need to be evangelized. So, for my friends and neighbors who do not believe the gospel, what do I do for them? I pray for them regularly that they would come to know the saving gospel of Jesus Christ because they need it desperately for eternal life. And then I evangelize. I preach the gospel such as is wise to them. I try and share them the truth and the life-giving power of Jesus' kingdom. And in every way, I try and love them just as Jesus would have me love them. But I do not assume that they are Christians or that they are okay because they are not. So, having gone on this giant tangent, all to say that that probably isn't what Jesus means when he says, no one can take them out of my hand. That once you have uh, said a prayer once at a Bible camp as a kid, you're, you're good and you're in whether or not you're actually living as a Christian. Then what does that mean? Here's an explanation. This entire time, Jesus has been talking in the context of himself as the shepherd, right? And we are the sheep, his followers are the sheep, and there are some bad actors out there that he calls wolves and robbers. The wolves are the ones who try and eat the sheep and destroy them. The robbers are the ones who try and either steal them or, again, destroy them for their own ends, they may be wicked preachers or they may be literal demons in the metaphor that Jesus put forward. Notice, by the way, that in the seed parable, the devil makes an appearance. Does he make an appearance for those who say that they believe? No. He makes an appearance for that first group, the ones that never believe in the first place. The devil comes to snatch the seed away before they even have time to believe. And so we have wolves and robbers that come and try and uh, take the sheep, affect the sheep. What if what Jesus is saying is this, for those who belong to him, no outside influence can steal or destroy them. That if you are one of Jesus' sheep, you do believe in him, you do love him, you have accepted the gospel and you are locked in for eternity and then you are growing in sanctification. What if... You are protected spiritually. What if God does protect us? Now, it is still clearly important for us to endure in the faith. Again, I brought up Hebrews 3, but there are many, 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 many other passages that call Christians to endure in their faith. Exhort one another, Hebrews says. That means when we get together, we should encourage one another. We should um, help to set a culture of uh, Christ following. We should um, help each other to endure. But also, what if Christ provides protection to his people? And that those who endure to the end cannot be affected in their eternal life. That can't be affected in any way. This is why the context of eternal life is so important. What if your eternal life is certain? It is sure as a Christian. What if absolutely nothing can affect that as long as you remain faithful to him? I think that's the point that he is trying to put forward. There is no power stronger than the good shepherd. 
There's no demon. Satan himself is not powerful enough to corrupt or pervert or stymie Jesus' death and resurrection in any way, shape, or form. There's no human being who can be crafty enough or um, uh, uh, malignant enough to take away your salvation if you believe in him. Sheep, if you learn to recognize his voice and you follow it throughout all of your days, nothing can take eternity from you. And he says, my father is the guarantee of this. Jesus is the good shepherd. No one's more powerful than him, but God the father as well guarantees this. By the way, he's calling himself God in this comparison. He says, no one can take him out of my hand and the father as well. He does end this passage, by the way, by saying I am the father, I and the father are one. Believe me, we're going to talk about that, but we're going to wait until next week because it's really important. So, ultimately, as we read this, I want us to be encouraged as Christians. Because most of y'all are listening to his voice. Most of y'all do know his voice. And if you are in that place, you need to be encouraged because eternity is real and it cannot be taken from you. You've already achieved it. You've got it. It's in the bag. It is a sure thing. And that is a wondrously encouraging thing. The worst that this crooked and and, uh, corrupt world has to offer is nothing compared to the glory that awaits those who belong to the king for the flock. We have glorious, beautific, Elysian fields waiting for us to eat off of because he has guaranteed it. We are in his hand and no one can take us. Take comfort in that this week. Be encouraged by that this week. Be motivated by that for the rest of your lives. Please join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you for uh, your words, Lord. We thank you for your guarantee of eternal life for us, Lord. And I pray that uh, we would be encouraged by that. We would be motivated by that. And Lord, ultimately, I pray that this would be something that allows us to do hard things for you. I pray, Lord, that we could endure. I pray that we would help one another, that we would encourage one another. We would continue to uh, drink from the fountain of your word, from the living water. And Lord, I just pray that in all of these things, you would be glorified as your people learn to follow your voice. In your name we pray, amen. We now have the opportunity to take what we've heard and turn it around to worship. As always, we'll do this through the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Over the next couple of minutes, we'll play some hymns. Uh, Please form a line and come and grab the elements. Take them back to your seats, and we will say a liturgy together. I'll see you then. Let us come to the table of the living Christ among us. O Lord Jesus Christ, We confess that we have sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and deeds. We have failed to love our neighbors, and we have disobeyed your commands. And cleanse us of all unrighteousness, that we may walk in your ways. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now take and eat. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now take and drink. The Lord Jesus Christ is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Please remain standing. Well, love my.
my God would bring you down to earth. What king would take a low and lonely birth? Yet to this dark and broken place you came to sleep beneath the stars that you remain. i 
failing body, I now resign for the angels point my way. Yes, I go. go today remember that you are assured eternal life if you belong to Christ Amen. know his voice and no one will ever take you out of his hand yes. go in peace